So in the Great Commission, Christ gave two commands. And like I said, these were the imperatives. The imperatives, the first imperative is to evangelize to the lost. Then, baptize the ones that were saved with their public confession of Christ's salvation and lordship. The commandment is to preach the gospel in those that receive it then to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which means to welcome them in to the kingdom of God, which is includes the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the second imperative is to teach them to obey Christ's commands. And so with this, the Great Commission is a command to the universal church. And it's also a command to the local churches because the local churches are part of the universal worldwide church. And with this, Christ has set a structure in the local churches by providing local churches with a pastor or pastors, plural, pastors and teachers, which is the same role, to equip the saints at that church for the work of service and the building up of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 tell us this, that each local church is to have pastor teachers. It doesn't mean that, speaking of the local church here, it doesn't mean that I am supposed to travel all the way and I, I got to be in Africa next week and then I'm going to go over to the South Pole and then I'm going to go over here. No, it's, it's establishing a local church. Establishing a local church structure is what Jesus is talking about here. And we'll see more of this, Jesus talking about this as we move through here. And with this, this teaching is to come through initially preaching. It's supposed to come through preaching the word of God boldly and accurately. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us this. And with this, the command to make disciples means not only to evangelize to them, but to teach them to obey what Christ said. And where do we see that? In the Bible. That's where we see his word. And with this then, Christ has therefore given preachers to proactively lead in purity and protection of his beloved church. Let me just say that again. Christ has therefore given preachers to the local churches for the sake of their purity and protection. And with this, we're going to look at the importance of preaching. And with that, we're going to actually take it a step further. What kind of preaching? We're going to talk about for a minute, expository preaching. Very easy to uh, describe. It's a big, scary word. I think it has, what, three syllables. Very easy to understand. We're going to be talking about the value and the importance of expository preaching. The first, the definition of expository preaching is, it is preaching that exposes, that's where we get the word expository, You've heard of an expo or an exposition. It's exposing, it's the kind of preaching that exposes the passage as to what it really means according to its context. Therefore, expository preaching eliminates something being taken out of context. That's what expository preaching is. It explains the meaning of the passage, not just reading some passage and then moving somewhere else. It explains it because all kinds of false religions, including the uh, adolescent, uh, the religion of the adolescent teenager in America religion, um, quotes this Matthew 7, 1, where Jesus says, do not judge. But when you read the whole passage, all the way through verse 5, Jesus is actually commanding that we do judge, but not hypocritically. So this false religion of the American adolescent will say, do not judge and run away with that. And we, as expository preachers, say, wait, wait, wait. We try to grab them and pull them back and say, 
wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're running with something. We have to exposit the whole passage to understand what it really means. So that's the easiest one that everybody in this room who's been a teenager, I'm pretty sure, uh, or, or is going to be, is in this room here. Now, what we see here is that we are then ex expository preachers have to then study the Bible and find out what it really means. And with this, there is no room for various opinions or interpretations. There's no room to say, well, we believe this at that church, and they believe that at that church, and you know, we just agree to disagree. What's that? It's either there's truth or there's no truth. And if if you feel like you can just come to this church and take in this and then take in that and just say, well, now I can come up with my own mind, what it really means, that means you're creating your own religion. So we don't want to do that. So with this, there's only one truth, and expository preaching exposes that truth. Either you're here for the truth or you're here for some other reason. I'm here for the truth. I hope you are too. Second, another term attached to expository preaching is sequential expository preaching. And that's what we do here. And what it is, is it's preaching book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse in an expository manner. All that means is, since these various books, uh, the order of the books is not necessarily as important, but when we have an individual author who's writing a letter to the church of Thessalonica, then we want to take the whole letter in context and understanding. Sequential expository preaching means we start out in 2 Thessalonians and we start out in chapter 1, verse 1. And we go all the way through to chapter 3, verse 18. And that's called sequential expository preaching. Now, that ensures that we don't take something out of context and we get to the point of what he really meant. And just so you know, when Paul wrote these letters to these churches, you can imagine that they just looked at these letters they hey, hey, hold on, we got a letter from Paul. They read it. It might have taken, let's say it took them even 30 minutes to get through the, reading the letter. They understood the letter because they didn't have to go through what the original Greek meant. They didn't have to understand the context. They didn't have to understand what was going on there. They just, they could understand If We have to go through 2,000 years of going through and blowing all the dust off and going through the different languages and seeing what it means. But back then, it was just read, and it had a meaning. And everybody that walked away from listening to Paul's letters understood what it meant. And that's what our, my job is then to unpack all these things to basically help you to be informed in the same way that the Thessalonians were. They were not allowed to have their own opinion about the letter. It's like, no, this is what Paul says. This is what he says. Therefore, this is what he meant. That's the beauty of sequential expository preaching. Now, you guys know this, and it's going to happen. In fact, it might, it's going to happen the next two weeks. We're going to hit exposit certain passages that are not necessarily that we're in a sequential order, but we're going to look at passages for a particular subject that need to be addressed at the time. And we do that here quite often. Um, you know that there will be a passage that uh, we will go along the same subject matter in this particular book, and then I'll do dig in deeper and spend more time in another passage that explains this one better, but it's still expository preaching because we're taking the Bible according to what the Bible says it means. That's what expository preaching is. Now, the benefits of this, the benefits of this sequential expository preaching and just expository preaching in general, as, is the, as the Bible is in, interpreted according to its context and not taken out of context, what it means is it addresses every single sticky issue, even the ones that you don't want to hear and even the, the ones that my flesh doesn't want to hear. We're going to hear them. Because we're going to go through, and I cannot then pick and choose. Oh, I don't like that one. Oh, the whole congregation knows I'm guilty of this, so I'm going to avoid that one. No, it means we're all going to be uncomfortable at one point, or maybe three times a, a month. But we're going to see what it says according to its context. What we're going to do then by expository preaching is making sure that we address every issue that's needed for godliness. John 17, 17 says, the word is truth. It sanctifies us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. Therefore, even if you're absent one day, it's really important if you could look back at the sermon 
so that when you come the following Sunday, you won't be lost. And I'll say this, and and you guys know this, that my primary audience is you guys. And if somebody, um, the, 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 not every sermon stands on its own in the sense of, I'm somewhat relying on you guys being a, a, a understanding the, the passage that we just preached. It's for your own benefit so that you understand what I'm preaching today that you heard what I preached on last week because it's following the line. So not only do I have to find the interpretation the right way by doing that, it's for your benefit too. So if you can't see a sermon, you're out of town, things like that, then it's for your benefit to make sure you, you watch it by the next week so that you can then not take things out of context and learn it for yourself. So with this then, exposit, sequential expository preaching forces the preacher first and then the people to deal with all the sticky issues without us getting to pick and choose what they are. Because we want to avoid the things that make us feel uncomfortable Sequential expository preaching says, we're going to talk about this, and this is where we are, and it's just the way it is, <laughs> and we need to suck it up. With this, very, very important about expository preaching. It helps sin to be addressed before it causes more damage. It helps to address the sin of the heart before it comes out in words and deeds against somebody else. It's proactive. It nips it in the bud so that even if you're not even struggling with that sin, you hear it ahead of time, and if you start to tend to go that way, oh, I'm not even going there. That's what expository preaching does. It eliminates this. Not, okay, so it's good for the other people around you. And listen to this part. It eliminates the shame of somebody else pointing it out to you. Is anybody embarrassed or ashamed when somebody has to point it out to them? I am. It eliminates that. In other words, it's a relief for you to not have to go through it being pointed out to you. <laughs> and it's a relief for all of us to not have to point it out to you because it's awkward, let's face it, for all of us. None of us want to deal with this. So what we're talking about is being proactive. Therefore, this does, and you'll see it today, this foundation then, is a foundation also of how sin will be addressed in the local church so that you know what to expect, how sin will be dealt with in the local church. And it helps with personal counseling because what it means is that if somebody here has an issue, I need to go talk to Dave about this uh, issue, and then I'll immediately says but I already know what he's going to say. Meaning, you don't have to come to me because you already know what he's going to say. Why? Because I'm going to point you back to the Bible that you've already heard, and you're just going to say, okay, so it, it, it eliminates wasting everybody's time and helps you to not even sin in the first place or helps you to deal with even hurt ahead of time because you've heard it. Wow, this thing was really bothering me, and I thought I was going to have to talk to somebody about this, but now I realize, wait a minute. This is the other guy's problem. I might have to talk to him about it, but or my past or whatever, but I got it now. I understand it now. Expository preaching deals with these things ahead of time and avoids these things that can get out of control. With this, then, it helps to have everybody on the same page if sin does pop up. If sin does pop up, Everybody knows, yet. Yeah, we know how I have to deal with this. It's not a surprise. <gasps> There's sin, and what do we do? And everybody running around all freaked out. No, we, we're already pre-programmed on what the Bible says and what we're supposed to do. Oh, so this, this is all proactive. It eliminates surprises about how sin will be dealt with. It's a restraint system of being proactive against sin by God's word. That's what expository preaching is. It's proactive, so people say, oh, I'm not even going to go there. I already know where this is going to lead. Therefore, expository preaching helps to avoid conflict before it starts and instead teaches godliness. And with this, then, Christ has established, like we talked about, 
Christ has established structure, order, and accountability in a local congregation. Christ has established this. And this then establishes the reason that we have the term today called church membership. And all it is is a word for what the Bible already teaches about belonging to a local congregation. Church membership is a group of Christians in a local, regional, or regional area coming together for mutual accountability between each other and the under-shepherds of the church who are also to be held accountable by the shepherd himself and the people. I'm still held accountable to you guys. That's what church membership does. It says, yeah, I'm part of this. I am part of this. In other words, these are then people who desire to put themselves under Christ and his design for his church in submission and service rather than being, and it sounds harsh, and I, I'm going to say it anyway, after you have recognized that it's the church you need to be at, after you've done a, a good investigation, which you have to do, and it might take a long time, so we get that. But the bottom line is, if you are somebody who decides that you are just going to be here sometimes, you would be considered a non-committal consumer. Meaning, hey, I'm just here for the stuff. I'm just here for the fellowship, but I don't want nobody telling me nothing. I don't want anything to do with any responsibilities. That, that's the bottom line. That's what we see here. And so with this then, that uh, this is something that Paul then had also established in the local church, putting together elder positions and qualifications for elders. Titus 1 talks about, and we're going to be talking about this in the next few weeks, how Titus 1 talks about establishing structured leadership in each local church. We see this in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. And we see this as Paul addressing the elders at the church in Ephesus. Keep in mind, once again, the church in Ephesus, the church in Corinth, the church in Thessalonica, the church in Colossae. These are local churches that are being addressed. This is what Paul said to those in, uh, in, Ephesia, in Ephesus. To the shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In other words, he was talking to them who were uh, <coughs> shepherds of the church that Christ purchased with his own blood. And with this, like I said, we see all these epistles written to local churches about taking care of your business at your church. That's what we see. We see different things going on at different churches. Some of them overlap. But Paul is holding leaders accountable for their individual churches as he writes these letters to the leaders of the church and saying, hey, take care of your business at your church. You need to deal with this. Corinth, you need to deal with this. Ephesus, you need to deal with this. And that's what establishes local churches. And 1 Corinthians 12, the whole chapter talks about being a member of the body. Paul uses the illustration of the body, uh, meaning arms, fingers, and he applies it then to the body of Christ. In other words, um, oh, I am a finger for the church in Ethiopia. Well, what are you doing in Fillmore then? Well, I'm just kind of being the finger from a distance. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> they, they need you over there geographically. That's what we're talking about here. In all of this, church, local church membership has to do with a commitment between the sheep and the shepherds to practice to one another. And with this, this is something that is really no gray area. It's black and white about this. Jesus says this, He who is not with me is against me, and he, does, he who does not gather with me scatters. Matthew 12, 30. In other words, there's a line. Either you're in or you're out. It, it's a line of are you part of the local church? And Jesus will get into that more, so will Paul in a few minutes. With this, Jesus solidifies this commitment in his passage on local church discipline in which he demonstrates that there is a line of being in or out of a local church congregation. With this, the terms discipline, everybody goes, ah, but everybody loves the word disciple. 
guess what? It's the same. It's the same root in English. That's why it's called discipline and disciple. It's somebody who is being taught, somebody that's growing. That's the word discipline. Everybody here, every Sunday morning and beyond, is under church discipline, including me. I'm being discipled by what the church is supposed to teach me, which is the Bible. And with this, then, being a disciple of Christ, according to his word, is painful because it is a double-edged sword that judges. Hebrews 4.12, ouch, 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 ouch. It is painful to be a Christian. When proactive discipline is ignored, as that happens, I could preach this all day long. I don't know if any of you have ever had kids you told them a million times not to do something, and they do it anyways. Christ has a remedy then for reactive discipline for the local church. And Christ, as head of the church, has taught on reactive dealing with sin in the local church. We see this then in his famous and controversial passage of Matthew 18. Matthew 18, we'll go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. This is what Jesus says about this sticky topic. But yet, when you unpack it all, not just what we're going to read, but what you unpack with what I've already said, what the Bible says, it's very easy to grasp. It's not anything very complicated. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus says this, If your brother sins, go and show him his faults in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Case closed. Verse 16, But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. That's number two. You notice Let's just back up for a minute. Proactive means nobody knows, nobody's uncomfortable, nobody's a victim, nobody has to tell you anything. It's just quiet, and you deal with it yourself by the conviction of the Holy Spirit according to the Word of God. Then Jesus is saying, let's keep it minimal here. Let's keep the damage minimal, the, the discomfort minimal. Just you personally go and talk to them so that there's not this discomfort. But if that doesn't work, you bump it up. Jesus says, take two or three witnesses with you so that every fact may be confirmed. Re number 17, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, you notice we're getting the word out of this, he does not listen or he refuses to listen. What are we getting into the realm of? Stubbornness, sin, rebellion. But step by step, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. What church is he talking about? Okay, i got to send a letter to all the churches in Ventura County, all the way to Ethiopia. Everybody needs to know about this. Which church is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the local church, the one that he's in. That's what he's talking about. If he refuses to listen even to the church, in other words, well, I can't go to the next step because I haven't notified there's a church in uh, Orange County that I think that I, didn't, I didn't notify them yet. No, it's the local church, Jesus is saying, is, is meaning here. Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And we know what that means. Jesus was describing somebody that is acting as an unbeliever. Therefore, he's saying, let him be to you as an unbeliever, which means treat him as an unbeliever. You thought he was a believer, and now you go, okay, wait, wait, things are a little bit different here. He's showing me some true colors here. Verse 18 says this, truly, this is Jesus speaking, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, in other words, whatever you agree with, whatever you take care of regarding sin on earth, shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loose in heaven. What does that mean? When you're following what Jesus says, when you're following what the Bible says, and you as leaders in the church come up with a conclusion about somebody, heaven already agrees with you. It has already been uh, loosed in heaven. It has already been bound in heaven. What does that mean? Bound, in other words, this person, we are saying this person is un in unrepentant sin and heaven agrees with us because we've gone through heaven's process. Anybody that we recognize as being, 
as being repentant, then we forgive them and we have loosed them from the bondage of being under this investigation and heaven will agree with you is what this means. This is all what Jesus says. And here we go once again. And this passage has been taken totally out of context, but so that you know that the next two passages are related directly to church discipline. And you guys have heard this passage a million times applied everywhere else, but it applies to church addition, um, discipline. <laughs> again, I say to you, this is Jesus, that if two of you agree on earth about anything, I'm sorry, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. In other words, you are agreeing with them. You're going along with this program. And then Jesus says this in verse 20. This is the context of this passage. For when two or were, two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. You guys have heard that all over the place. Oh, because I have to pray because otherwise we have to have two of us there because Jesus won't come, but now that I need to find somebody else to pray with so that I, he actually hears my prayers, you guys have heard that taken out of context. It's attached to church discipline saying, Lord, we've been dealing with this guy. What are we supposed to do? How are we handling this? Are we handling this the right way? And therefore, he is with you in, in the sense of agreement. It's very easy to understand once we look at it in context because you, everybody here knows, hey, I need to talk to somebody because Jesus. Cause I need Jesus there when I pray. Well, you, you have the Holy Spirit Jesus is spirit with you 24-7. So you can see this, how it's been taken out of context. Christ wants sin dealt with in his church. Paul had to exercise Christ's process for the sin of the church in Thessalonica. You're wondering how we got here to church discipline? Paul brought us here in sequential expository preaching. <laughs> Why are we talking about that today? Who's in trouble? Well, we're talking about it because Paul brought us there. And sequential expository preaching. With this, Paul taught us this, and through their dilemma of a specific brand of sin, Paul reveals some further details that are general details about handling general sin in the local church, which Paul, when we know, points back to Christ. Paul is laying out some of these things that Christ has already taught us on and taught Paul on, and now he's saying, and by the way, you guys got this issue in your church, and this is the way you need to deal with it. And by the way, you deal with it this way specifically, as we talked about in the last two weeks, dealing with sluggards. Now he's talking about dealing with general sin in the church in this passage. So what we're going to see here, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, which show two components of church discipline that will help you to see and submit to Christ's attitude of sin in the church. We're going to see two things that will help you to see and submit to Christ's attitude about sin in his church. 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 14 through 18. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, <clears throat> that means the whole letter, not just chapter 3 or chapter 2. Take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. And then we get to verse 17, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes. What we see here then is the context was initially, as we saw in the verses just prior to this, was the context of specifically a sluggard. And with this, they were in verses 3 through 13 talking about a sluggard, and we saw that they had at least one sluggard in the church, and we saw then that Paul had to take Christ's steps of discipline to deal with this sluggard, or sluggards plural. And while dealing with the, as I said, while dealing with the sluggard specifically in this passage today, the context deals with unrepentant sin in the local church generally. That's why that's what got us here. Our sequential exposition of the passage. So first, we see two things that are going to help us to see 
and submit to Christ's attitude. First of all, we see in this passage the duty of church discipline. This was in verse 14 that we just read. We saw it earlier in verse 6. We'll see a little more of that in a minute. Verse 14 says this, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Wow. So first of all, we will go back to verse 6 for a minute. It initially speaks about how to handle this, and then verse 14 makes it a little more clear. Paul says this in verse 6. Now, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. From us, Which is what Paul is saying in verse 14, not according to our letter that we gave you, and the letters we've given you. Now, in verse 14 here, we see the commands that Paul gives and the reason for the commands in verse 14. First of all, the first command is to keep away from that person. The second command is to take note of that person. What does that mean? It means staying away from him and doing this. In other words, that person is now not that you are just taking note of him, but that everyone's taking note of him. It's take note of him, make note of him means publicly say, stay away from that guy. So you're staying away from him personally, and you are publicly telling everyone else. This is where we're at. Paul is giving this to the leaders of the church, or the leader, depending on how far along they are in their church plant. He's telling them, take note of that person, and don't associate with them. Why? 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 So that he will be put to shame. That doesn't sound good, but we know the opportunity came through preaching way earlier and this person has wanted to take it this far. So now it goes from proactive discipline to reactive discipline. We also know that Paul had already talked to them previously on at least two occasions. So we know that Paul has taken the steps of Christ. Verse 14, take note, special note of that person, and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. This is the third step that Jesus talked about in Matthew 18. This is the third step that Jesus talked about as we read it earlier. The first step is confronting the person one-on-one -on -one in private, minimizing public shame and other damage. Public shame to him and hopefully minimizing other damage to other people that he's been sinning against. Hopefully keeping it quiet. It's so much better for me to preach and you guys walk out of here and none of us have to deal with your sin or my sin. It's so much easier if we just listen to what the Bible says. It's so much easier, but it might come to that stage. If no repentance at that stage, if she's talking to him personally, returning with two or more witnesses is what Jesus tells us. And if no repentance still, tell it to the church to shame him, yet to teach, treat him as a brother. This is what we have here in verse 14. This is Jesus' third step that he described. Paul is describing this third step. He took the other steps, and here we are. And what this does is it applies biblical pressure on the person and the situation. In other words, it's not my personal pressure on somebody, not my threats to somebody, it's the biblical pressure you're putting on somebody. See, if you have biblical pressure, this double-edged sword that you were to take up with the armor of God, that's what you use. Biblical pressure on circumstances and people. Not your own bullying, not your own opinion, not your own loud voice. It's what the Bible says. And with this, as you know, this well, this biblical pressure really does show who's who in the zoo. When somebody is confronted with something in this manner where uh, this is, I do not want to be shamed here. I do not want to be part of this. I do not want this on my name. I do not want anything to do with this. It's what a Christian, a true Christian will do if their heart is right. They will like, I don't want anything to do with that stuff. But, like I said, with this though, True believers will be devastated at being separated from the other brethren and 
having a bad reputation. Like, I don't want any part of that. True believer, you put a little pressure on them in these stages, and they're going to be like, I don't want any part of that. However, and this is what verse 15 says, Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And with this pressure, if it goes to that awkward, uncomfortable step, what it does is it gives them a time for reflection and repentance for a true brother or sister. It's the same thing we do on Communion Sunday. We allow time. We've preached. We've reminded you not to be a hypocrite. We reminded ourselves not to be a hypocrite. And given us time now that the rubber meets the road, we're taking communion. We're going to the Lord saying, yes, I have unity with you. I'm confident my unity with you and with others. It's the time of reflection and repentance when we listen to that, that music as the elements are being passed out. It's the same thing that someone should feel then when they're looking at it like, I don't like being off on my own. I don't like it when people are viewing me as an unbeliever. I don't like this. i got to repent. That's called reflection and repentance. That's what we're hoping for. And with this, though, as Jesus says, if he still does not repent, going back to Matthew 18, Jesus says this, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him to be to you as either uh, as a Gentile or tax collector. And what this means, and Jesus is saying, very simple, this is excommunication from membership of the local church that you were in. It can't be more clear than that. Jesus is saying he's not one of you anymore. He's one of them. At least he's acting that, that way, treat him that way. What does that mean? It means he's not part of of the local church anymore. He's no longer a member. Jesus makes it a, a line, either you're in or you're out. And that's uh, in, in what? In the local church. What is, it, it doesn't mean that now we got to send letters all the way to Ethiopia again and tell everybody that he's out of the church. No, you deal with it in your own local church. That's what church membership is about. Now, Paul says this, and he and he. He talks about how even this excommunication from membership is still hope. This is what he says. And Paul knows there's hope, and we know there's hope. Paul gave this example of reasoning to a local church that was having a problem. He gave an example of this reasoning to the church in Corinth for such an unrepentant sinner. He says this, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5, I have decided, because he's the leader, to deliver such a one to Satan for destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow, that's pretty heavy. I have released him to Satan. Hey, do what you got to do. And, and, and I'll just take a side note on that. Every single person that has unbelievers in their family and are trying to protect them from their own sin Paul is saying this about them. Is Paul is saying, I have delivered them to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It goes right back to feeding the bears or not. If you feed the bears, then they'll rely on you and they'll never learn how to find their own food. If you let them out by themselves in the big, bad, scary world, there's a chance of them figuring it out. And with this, Christ's final and painful stage of church discipline forces the person, and this is, what, this is what it means by releasing him over to Satan. It forces the person to be outside the warm fellowship of the local church and instead be exposed to Satan and his mean, cruel, scary, cold, nasty world. That's what Christ is saying. That's what Paul is saying is, okay, we've gone through these stages and now we're at the point is evidently you don't get it. Evidently you don't get it. And with this, the hope then is that the unrepentant sinner will hit rock bottom and finally seek the Lord. How many of us needed that? <laughs> That's the way people are saved. It's the wake-up call. And we see this wonderful example in our own lives and we see this wonderful example in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. When did he turn? When he was rock bottom. And this is the whole point. So that even if his body gets trashed, it'll be well with his soul. 
Wow. Do we pray then for our loved ones that are lost, that, that God will protect them in their body and make everything comfy for them and that they'll have plenty of money? Or do we pray that God will do what he's going to do? Do what you got to do, Lord, so that he may be saved. What's our priority for our loved ones, for our kids? And with this, along with dealing with the sinner, the sin also needs to be dealt with. And with this, verse 10, as we can go back, we talked about it the last few weeks, just the example of the sluggard, but it applies very easily to all these circumstances. Verse 10 says this, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. That's dealing with the sin. Not just the sinner, but the sin. It's saying we're not going to have that here. We're, so we have two different things here. We have the sinner and the sin. In this sense, in this part that we're at here, we're talking about dealing with the sin itself. So regardless of what phase the sinner is in in church discipline, the sin must be stopped immediately. Okay, so what that means is that, yeah, the sinner is still sorting it out. The Lord's still working on them. We're still going through this process with the sinner. But the sin cannot be here. Two different things here. They, they come together in the same person, but the sin is not allowed here. If the sinner wants to practice sin, he or she is to be removed from the fellowship immediately, without the process. This is what Paul is even saying. He's saying this, Therefore a sluggard cannot join in the Lord's Supper as he is not to be fed. That, that sin... Regardless of what we're dealing with, this slugger, this, that, and the other, it's the sin, no, we're not going to put up with that. So while we're dealing with you and you have to figure out your whole life, you have to do all these things, that's okay, it might take a while. But that sin is not going to happen here. In the same way, as we talked about earlier, we are not going to allow an immediate, uh, an active shooter or a child molester to come in the door and give them a few weeks for them to repent while we try to sort this whole thing out. The sin is not going to come in here. That's what Paul is saying is he's not to be fed either. He doesn't say go through this part of the process. No, the sin has to stop. And with this, the process and exclusion of sin itself, in other words, getting rid of the sin, stops victimization right away. It pressures the sinner to repent by saying, you can't, you want to hang on, if you wanted to leave that stuff outside, you could come in. But if you're going to bring that in here, you're not welcome either. And keep in mind, somebody that wants to hang on to their sin is the problem. Sin is always attached to somebody. And that's why when we saw Jesus on the cross, the sin was with him. The sin was not punished by itself. But if a sinner who Jesus was willing to take it on on our behalf attached to him, he was punished by it. So if somebody wants to hang on to their sin, hey, you're welcome to come in, but if you want to bring your stuff in with you, no, you can't. And this is the, the Bible gives us all the answers to these sticky things. And what it does is, so it stops victimization right away. It pressures the sinner to repent and see if this makes sense. It shows the watching world what the real Christian thing to do is. We're not just a bunch of, and the term is this, bleeding heart liberals that think that we're going to put up with everything and we're just going to turn the cheek to all these things. That's even taken out of context. Turning the other cheek that Jesus talked about was, was don't be humiliated. If somebody wants to offend you, by sla it was a slap in the face. Don't, just, don't, don't worry about a slap in the face. Don't be offended. Don't let your pride get hurt. But what we're talking about here is that the real world needs to see that we are not going to put up with this. In the same way, the real world needs to deal with... Uh, Corruption allegations against the police department. The police department needs to show the whole world. We're not putting up with this Because it hurts our credibility see the watching world wants to make us out to be a bunch of pacifists And no, no, we're gonna say no to this stuff We want the watching world. We want people has anybody in this you don't have to raise your hands in this room Ever been victimized at a church and nobody did anything about it? Well here we're gonna do something about it. It's a safe place so Practicing church discipline is a duty for all believers. And I'm going to show you what Paul says about that in 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. 
1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 initially. And this really hits at home that it is the duty of all believers. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. I wrote in my letter not to associate with immoral people, Paul says to the church in Corinth. Get this part. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. In other words, you have to be out of this world if you're going to avoid all that. But actually, you got to get this, these two words, but actually, meaning that's not what I meant. But since you guys took it wrong, I'm going to clarify it. Verse 11. But actually, I wrote to you to not associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one, which Paul is talking about dealing with the sluggers even in, this, in our passage. This is what he says in verse 12. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? And he says this. Do you not judge those who are within the church? When, when people say, Jesus said, do not judge. And Paul is saying, you don't, are you telling me that you don't actually judge those people that are in your church? What's the matter with you people? He says this. But those outside, God judges. But he says this in verse 13. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. <laughs> in other words, God's going to judge all them. We're not the moral police dealing with that guy and that guy and that guy. We're, that's not our job. But inside the church, when somebody says they're a Christian and they come in here and bring all their stuff in to affect everybody else and affect the purity and the protection of everybody else, no, we're not going to do that. So with this, that's the duty of church discipline. Now the desire of church discipline, verse 15 and 16 Paul says this, and we talked about this, we overlapped here. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, he goes on, now may the peace, I'm sorry, now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. Peace is the desire of church discipline. The end result that we want out of church discipline is peace. Do we want peace? Yes. Peace is the lack of sin. Peace is things being the way they're supposed to be. We want things to be the way they're supposed to be. We don't want sin. Sin is, is we don't have peace then. Therefore, peace comes through dealing with sin, through purity and protection. So with this, purity in the church then from the sinner who contaminates others, like, we can't let this go on because now other people are going to do it. Our whole church is being corrupted because we're allowing this to happen. That We need purity in the church. And with this, purity from sin in the local church then means peace with God. That means we're operating the way that we're supposed to be before God. We have peace with Him because we're not putting up with sin. Secondly, it is protection for the church from the sinner who threatens problems. And protection from sin in the local church then means that we have peace with one another. Purity in the church means we have uh, peace with God. Protection in the church means that everybody has peace among each other. It's a nice place to come to. It's a place that you can come to and talk to people and trust people to the extent that you can, even though we're all still sinners. That's the desire of church discipline is to bring about peace. And with this, our Prince of Peace offers reconciliation for peace with God and one another. Our Prince and Prince of Peace, Christ himself, provides reconciliation for peace between God and us and us and others. So he says this, Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. We see now, and like I said, we're in step three. And the hope of church discipline is for the sinner, is there for reconciliation through their repentance. Therefore, he will have peace with God and he will have peace with others. That's the whole idea of church discipline. 
is not just to throw everybody out. <laughs> it's a matter of, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're, you're, you're staying stubborn a lot longer than you should be here, but we're, there's still hope for you. If you're really a Christian, we, we can trust our Prince of Peace. And with this then, while not allowing social contact or fellowship, nor the ability for them to continue in their sin, there's still an open door. There's still an open door for limited contact for the sake, for the sake of shaming the person into repentance. Paul talks about how this all works for all of us in this situation on step three. Galatians chapter one, verse two. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, and let's clarify that for a minute. We know at Sesame Creek Bible Church what that means, somebody who's spiritual. Some other church might give you a different definition. We mean mature Christians who pay attention to what the Spirit of God tells them. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Keep in mind this part. You've got to get this. Each one looking to yourself. <laughs> Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, and making sure you get the log out of your own eye so that you will not be tempted. In other words, don't get sucked into their stuff and don't get all cocky and arrogant because you're the big guy that's helping them. Bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. That was Galatians 6 1. Paul, I mean, Christ talked about this regarding this repentance. Jesus says, as a warning for us in Luke 17, 3 and 4. See, you, you can't just grab part of this and run out the door. <laughs> you have to hear the whole thing. Jesus talks about this regarding this subject. Luke 13, 17, 3 and 4. Be on your guard. In other words, pay attention. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. <laughs> you got to get that part right. Yeah, you're going to speak up and rebuke him. And he might be the guy that we treat as an unbeliever and say, you can't even come back in this room. But yet, there's an open door that if he repents, forgive him, Jesus says. <laughs> and well, how, what does it mean he said he repents? Do you believe him? No. You don't. You look at fruit before you just all of a sudden let him back in and hand him a gun and let him sit in the church. What I'm getting at is we are supposed to see the fruit of repentance. Well, where is that? Oh, it's in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 11. Lays out the, the, the evidence of innocence. There's a whole sermon on that if you want to look at it. Um, evidence of innocence, but these things, all seven of them, show what true repentance looks like. Which means, think about this, for me. if you see what real repentance looks like, and you've dealt with somebody at stage one, you can see what that looks like. Or you might say, oh, this guy's saying he's repenting, but I don't see it. Or, wow, this person, I really do see these things, man. I don't need to say anything else to anybody else. I'm going to celebrate with this guy and celebrate with the Lord, and nobody else needs to know about it. We need to know what repentance looks like. You don't just go by if somebody says, I repent. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing as people saying Jesus is Lord. Yeah, but are they lying? Here we go. Seven attitudes of genuine godly repentance from 2 Corinthians 7, 11. First is their earnestness to quickly repent. Like, oh, man, I, oh, I, I, this is upset. I got to deal with this now. Let's deal with this now. I'm sorry. I don't want to do. Oh, man. That's an earnestness. Is They might not get to this earnestness until the last stage. But when they get to the point, it's like, I need to do this now. I want to talk in front of everybody. I want to get this over with. I hate this. I don't want anything to do with this. That's one of the signs. Earnestness to quickly repent. The second one is vindication of their name. And all this is in 2 Corinthians 7, 11. In other words, I don't want my name attached to that. Man, I got to get this off of my plate right now. I don't want this on my record. I don't want anything to do with it. Indignation towards sin is the next one. What does that mean? Not only am I guilty, not only do I want to get this taken care of, not only do I not want this on my, on my name, but I hate that sin. I don't want anything to do it. I denounce that sin, and I don't want anything to do with it. Get it away from me. I hate it. The next one is the fear of God, where they don't want to uh, deal with any more sin, where they, don't, they want to avoid sin. Now they're like, I don't want to be put in that position. I don't want to walk over there by that place anymore or by her house or anything like that. I want to avoid it. I don't want nothing to do with this again. I fear God. 
Um, I am going to do what I can to avoid future sin because I don't want anything to do with this. I do fear God. Next one is longing for reconciliation. We see this in, and we see all these in Zacchaeus, the tax collector, in the story that Christ uh, gives us about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, looking for reconciliation. In other words, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to make this right? I know I can't make it right with God without just repenting, but what do I owe people? Zacchaeus said, I'll pay back two or three times. If I have to fraud somebody, what do I need to do? Where do I sign? What do I do? Do I need to show up at their house and, and do something? What do I, what do I got to do? I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be done with this. And their zeal for righteousness, which is the opposite of indignation for sin. It means I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing. And the avenging of wrong. Meaning I'm willing to accept the, uh, the consequences. And like I said, uh, whatever it takes. Uh, but if, 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 if I need to go to jail for this, then so be it. Because I, I agree that sin needs to be taken care of, and there is punishment. And even if I'm saved from the punishment of God, there's still the consequences of society. Let's just, let's just do this. Those are the evidences of innocence. And with this, through repentance, a brother or sister can be restored back with a warm welcome back to church membership. And keep in mind, with this, as I said, there is hope for the sinner in step four who has already been even excommunicated from the church by his own choices, there's still hope for him, just like the prodigal son. He was the one who finally repented after hitting rock bottom. And what, would, what did the celebration look like? You guys know Luke 15. It was huge. The father welcomed him back, and everybody came around. All the servants came around. There's one guy that had, was bitter about it, his brother. But the celebration was huge when you welcome somebody back. With this, then, the reconciliation of even the most heinous of sinners requires, then, the removal of personal bitterness against the now repentant sinner. Now, you could be the problem if you refuse to forgive them. Now, if you refuse because you say, wait, 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 that, that one evidence you talked about there in 2 Corinthians 7 11, that's not there. Okay, that, that's something that needs to be dealt with. But if you flat out say, nope, I'm never going to forgive them, then who's the problem? <laughs> now, now you're the problem. You can, can you see how the Bible covers every single argument that everybody has about everything? It's all the answers are there. How to hate sin and yet love people. And I'm not going to say hate sin and love the sinner because that's been taken out of context, which means uh, it's been taken out of context in a sense Oh, we'll just welcome everybody in their sin and they can bring it all with them because we just love them. Yeah, we don't like what they do, but we love them. You can see that that is a disaster uh, when people say, we love the sinner but hate the sin. Yeah, well, then if, if you love the sinner then, and you hate the sin, that means when he brings it in and you're letting him come in, you don't really hate the sin that bad. So we need to keep, <laughs> can't take these things out of context. So let's remember that, that we, when he removes the sin and disassociates it from himself, He's welcome to come in. And we do still hate the sin, and we love the repentant sinner. Let's say that again. We love the repentant sinner. Now, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. We do love them in the sense that we want what's right for them. And what's right for them? For them to repent. So it all ties together. The Bible has all the answers. With this, purity and protection from sin brings about peace in the local church. And Paul knows, and we know, that that peace could only come from Christ, the Prince of Peace. So he says this, as we've said before, verse 16, Now may the Lord of Peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. And with this, peace is the overall lack of sin, and therefore peace comes from dealing with sin. And if you as individuals have peace with God, you're going to have peace with each other. All of us will. Now, the way this works is our peace with God brings us peace with one another. It's what we would call in marriage, uh, when we're talking about marriage, it's the shrinking triangle, which means as each individual person is closer to God, each individual person is automatically then closer to one another. And as you grow closer to God and the person sitting next to you grows closer to God, you're automatically growing closer together. Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far, far off, now let me just explain that, far off, means that the Jews and the Gentiles, you guys were miles apart. 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Why? Because each one of them has now submitted to Christ, and now Jews and Gentiles are now brothers and sisters in Christ. For he himself is our peace, who makes both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. And Jesus had prayed for this peace that, that demands peace with God first in Ephesians, I'm sorry, in John 17, his high priestly prayer for all Christians for all time, that they may all be one, one meaning O-N-E, that they may all be one together, even as you, Father, and I are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, Trinity has its unity. Our individual unity with the Trinity then brings us unity with each other. And with this, peace among Christians can only come when each Christian has peace with God. Otherwise, it's a false pre, uh, peace called ecumenicism, where we leave the Bible outside, and we all wink at each other. You don't talk about sin. I don't talk about sin. Let's just all say we're Christians and have a big party. That's ecumenicism. It's going on all over this whole world, including this whole county, where everybody comes together, leaves the Bible outside, and don't talk about sin, don't deal with sin, because it makes us feel uncomfortable opposite of the Bible, but it's a phony, look at us, we have unity. It's false. Paul had also then presented several sin issues that they needed peace for throughout his letters. And we need these same peace in these areas. So he's capping it off with this. First of all, they had they needed peace because they had persecutors from the outside of the church giving them a hard time. They were suffering. They needed peace from the outside sin coming in. The outside world of believers he talked about that how they would suffer. And Paul had mentioned throughout his epistles on how the enemies who sin against us will be will be taken down and go to hell with eternal punishment. And even that's upsetting to think about. We need peace in not, a, not only dealing with sin, but we need peace in like understanding like some people are going to go to hell and that's hard to swallow. We need peace to swallow that even. We need to be have peace with sin that's coming at us and sin with at peace with what God's going to do to these people that looks really ugly from our perspective, and we just got to have peace with that too. We need this peace. Also, the infiltration of false teachers inside the church, Paul talked about, and that caused fear. They needed peace from that. The announcement of the an explanation of the Antichrist and all the fear that he would cause, they needed peace from that. Man, that's ugly. So Paul's asking for peace for those issues. And then finally, like we talked about in the last couple of weeks, the disturbing sin inside the church from those who are considered brethren. That's upsetting. Wow, that, this person, I thought I could trust him, and this is upsetting. We need peace for all these things. And so Paul is talking about peace of, of this and the peace that we need to deal with the unrepentant sinner. And I have to be the one to go talk to him. Why can't somebody else go? I don't want to, I don't have peace with this. I need the peace deal with this because this is uncomfortable. It's it's just as uncomfortable for somebody to sin against you as it is for you to go tell them. Let's face it. It's all uncomfortable and we need peace in this. Especially if we're commanded to go tell them and if we don't, then we're in sin. We don't have peace. We need peace. So Thessalonians needed prayer for peace and so do we. So we saw these two components of church discipline that will help you to see and submit to Christ's attitude of sin in his local church, the duty of the discipline, which is for every church membership member to participate in, and the desire of discipline is peace. And we have to clean up a couple things that Paul says really simply. His benediction, the end of his letter, is in chapter uh, verse 16 through 18. Uh, starting in verse 17, we talked about 16. Verse 17, Paul says something that if you took it out of context, you go, what is he talking about? But we do things expositionally and sequentially that we understand, we'll understand what it means. Paul writes this in verse 17. I write this greeting in my own hand, and it, this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. What, what does that mean? Oh, wait, we go back to the first couple chapters, and we see that false teachers had sent them a letter that, that made it seem like it was written from Paul, and therefore, Paul is cleaning up. Hey, by the way, when I send you these letters, this is my signature. Don't believe the other guys. 
oh, we would have never known. It just seems all weird that he would put it, but we know it by, oh, yeah, we remember now that Paul was dealing with that. And so with this, interestingly about Paul's letters is that Paul, uh, Peter had confirmed that Paul's letters were actually Scripture. Peter says this is 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And with this today, coincidentally, there's a big controversy about Paul being the author. See, Peter says that Paul's writings are Scripture, and Paul says things that people don't like. So, you guys have heard this thing. Witnesses tell no tales. In other words, if we could get rid of Paul as the author, since Peter said Paul's writings were Scripture, and we don't like what Paul writes, we need to make it seem that Paul's writings aren't Scripture, because Paul says us a lot of things that, that we don't like. Paul, we don't like what Paul says about salvation and that we can't lose our salvation. We don't like what Paul says about the end times and rapture. We don't like what Paul says about women pastors. We don't like about what Paul says about spiritual gifts. We don't like what Paul says about dealing with disobedience. So, so we got to undermine Paul. And there's a huge attack, especially in the last couple of centuries, um, that Paul is hated. <laughs> and we just got to get rid of him. Dead men tell no tales, is that what they wanted to do with Lazarus. With this, then, Jesus said he would bring peace to those who love God, but a sword to the rest. So, the ones that don't love God, it's going to hurt really bad. We can have peace, even though it's going to hurt, but we can have peace. And, and Jesus says that in this peace that we have in Matthew 10, 34, that we will have peace and we can have peace with ourselves and God and with other Christians. But by doing that, it means that there won't be peace with our fans, family and friends that aren't Christians. It's just the way it is. Where do you want the peace? Do you want to have peace with the world and peace with your family, your outside family, or do you want to have peace with God and peace with those in the church? And so being a disciple of Christ is hard, <laughs> and we've not only been appointed for salvation, but also suffering for Christ's sake, Philippians 1, 29. And Paul finishes this at the end of his message to us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. And it concludes his second letter then to the Thessalonians. Let's go ahead and pray.